Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Hello and welcome to the latest look back at Talking Heads. Disturbing nesting birds, the right to call yourself Manx, the sharing of beneficial ownership information and the local authority general election were all up for discussion on the programme this week. Here's Stu Peters with more. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. Could the island actually cope with more visitors during the TT period? The Isle of Man Steam Packet last week hinted that visitor capacity could be addressed as part of a new strategic sea services agreement. The comments came as the company welcomed the appointment of a commercial promoter for the TT and Classic TT. But the suggestions being downplayed by the Chief Minister as the process of looking into future Irish sea ferry services continues. The Department of Infrastructure is currently exploring the issue of future sea services to and from the island. So there may be an option to increase capacity for TT and Classic visitors, but... Do you think the island could cope with a significant increase in visitor numbers during the TT and Classic TT? Or is the infrastructure already stretched by the numbers who come to those those race uh, periods as it stands? Rob's been on from Peel. I think we could cope with more visitors coming over for the TT. There's a very relaxed atmosphere during the fortnight. We could cope with a few thousand more of them, I'm sure. Not sure how the medical service is expected to cope with the proposed increased numbers for TT. This needs to be considered before increases in numbers, says Steve. Let's go. So in fact, let's roll out the red carpet. We've got a, a caller whose name I don't recognise. It's Colette. Hello, Colette. Oh, hello. Hello, you, you. You've not phoned us before, have you? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, well, <laughs> welcome to the programme and do it more often. Oh, well, if I have a reason to, I will. Go on. All right. What would you like to talk about? Well, uh, I have... uh, I come from Southern Ireland originally. Oh, yeah. I've I've been here for 30-odd years. But I have lots of family who come over with their... my great nieces and nephews. And, uh, you know, the the boat only comes from Dublin uh, once for the whole of the summer, just for the Tuesday. Yeah. So that means that when my nieces and their spouse... uh, uh, finish work, uh, say on the on the Friday, which most people do. Start their holidays the following Monday. Yep. They've lost three days of yeah. the holiday, yeah. and coming back, it's Tuesday again. So people are not coming. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's just it's not a good service. No, I've heard a lot of people complain about the uh, the Irish routes. Although, in fairness, I've been on the boat to uh, to Dublin a couple of times, and it was virtually empty. Well, why why is that? Because it's going at the wrong time. Yes. Wrong all right. Yeah. 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 Fair that's comment. Why, that's yeah. why Th- this island used to be full of Southern Ireland people coming on holiday. Yes. Well, they're not going to give up five days of the holiday. No. No. Now, I know they could all go to Belfast, but that's if you've got a children coming. Oh, it's you. quite a drive, isn't it? It's, it's a heck of a drive. Yeah, if you're yeah. going from Waterford or somewhere like that. Yeah, yeah. or the west of Ireland, Cork, or yes. where have you. Yeah. I, I'm Wexford where I am. It, it is a hell of a drive. Yeah, I'm course. trying to keep children <laughs> occupied in the car for that length of time. It's Are we there nice yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Or he's hitting me, Mum, and I'm... <laughs> <laughs> so occupy my sea. Oh no! So, so you <laughs> think that we're missing out on a, a great number of potential tourists already by not catering properly to the Irish market? Well, I agree. I think I that's agree. a very good point. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's all I have to say. Well, phone us again. We'll try and find something else that you'd like to call us about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Colette. Uh, that was what Colette thought. Just check current prices to get here from across. Steam packet price, £17.50 single. The flight from Gatwick booked in advance is just under 30 quid. Not expensive by any means. If you want to travel at peak times, you have to pay more. That's the way it is everywhere, not just here, says John. Very good point, John. Thank you. Day trips from a port in Northern Ireland or era to Peel by the Balmoral on race days would bring people over with no need for accommodation. Isn't the Balmoral a little sort of pleasure steamer? Uh, I mean, maybe it's doing that already, or there's nothing I wouldn't have thought to stop it from doing that. The increase in TT visitors will have as much substance to it as the claimed increase in air passenger numbers that we need the run- that we needed the runway extension for. None. Cynic. Stu, I can't quite understand why government are focusing on attracting more tourists to an event which already attracts multi-thousands. Surely, given that they're now actively promoting tourism with specialist tourism packages like the recently announced Celtic Festival and the Vintage Railways, etc., to boost the economy, 800,000 Celtic music enthusiasts arrive at Lorient annually, then shouldn't they be looking to increase tourism numbers across the summer season, not just TT and MGP? As homestay hosts, we couldn't begin to handle all the inquiries we received. How on earth current accommodation 
will cope with even more tourists is worrying. And that's from Pauline. Well, that's that's the, the question, really. Could we cope? Can you imagine that more people would maybe give Homestay a try? If you're doing it and you, you're uh, enjoying it, then maybe more people could be convinced to give it a go. I don't know. That's the question. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Who should have the right to call themselves Manx? The Manx Nationalist Party, McVanin, says it can't understand why the island's interim census wouldn't let people put Manx as their nationality. Sunday's interim survey had the option of British instead. The government says that it's people's legal nationality, whilst Manx is only their national identity. Who should have the right to call themselves Manx, then? Should it be down to being uh, about birth and parentage, or should all people living here full-time be classed as Manx? Afternoon, yes, sir, says Chris. According to my dictionary, the word Manx has the following definition. Of or relating to the Isle of Man, its inhabitants and language, etc. Furthermore, Manxman or Manxwoman is defined as native or inhabitants of the island. Well, I'm an inhabitant of the island. I feel that seeing that we're self-governing, we should be classed as a separate nation. Manx men or women are certainly discriminated against as regards their rights or lack of them in the European Union. Well, that doesn't bother me, and I don't know that it really matters to most people, to be honest. I, for one, consider myself to be more Manx than English, etc. Best regards from Chris M. Thank you, Chris. Let's go to the lines and see what uh, Sylvia makes of this. Hello, Sylvia. I can't understand why the government don't read Protocol 3, Article 6. And Manx people have been defined by the when the European Union started. It's right. It's been altered a little, as Mark Kernow had said, but basically it's the same. But a Manx person and a Channel Islander person are... If they, they must have been born and educated on the island, of parents who were born and educated off the, on the island, and uh, two grandparents who were born and educated on the island. And under those conditions, they are deemed to be Manx yeah. and have no rights to work or services in the European Union. But there's another one in 1996. I've got a letter from the Downing Street. It states, European citizens have no legal right to enter the Isle of Man to seek employment. Mm. And, uh, and that's because we haven't. Manx people haven't. Yes. But you have to fall into those categories, and the government should do a bit more research on, on agreements they've made and stick to them. Yes. And that wouldn't cause any of this hassle, but they they do it without any background, background research. And... Uh, I'm not, uh, I, I don't care. People have lived here for 30 years and they call themselves Manx. But officially and legally, they're not. Right. And if they do, um, they, their passport is stamped. Yeah. So, and, I mean, do, you, do you agree with Mark Kermode? Because he was saying that, you know, he feels as though this is some sort of a, a collusion by government to uh, to, to uh, get rid of, uh, of the word Manx. Uh, and well, the Manx as a nationality. I wouldn't go that far. I mean, people know who they are, and yeah. we were informed about this. Memory age has got some benefits. Mm. We were informed about this when we had our passports, and just recently a friend of mine went away and on holiday abroad and took very ill, and they wouldn't even end, uh, let her go into a hospital until she was a they wanted their passport. Yeah. It said she was Manx, which stamped as such, you know. And um, they wouldn't let her even in the hospital until she could prove that she was insured sufficiently to cover the treatment she needed. Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's the same for a lot of Manx. people. If if a British person went on holiday in America, for example, you'd get the same thing. So, you know, it's not discriminatory yeah, towards Manx, the Manx people. No, Manx people, the English people can go into... British people, then I call it England. Yeah. But they can go into um, into the uh, post office in England and get a green card to cover their health. Yes. I mean, uh, recently there was an there was a, on a television program, and these people who decided to go and live in Spain or whatever, um, they decided to go and live there. But they get there. Uh, one man surprised me by saying, "Well." They couldn't afford to stay there if uh, they were no longer part of the European. Yes. Because they wouldn't get free health care. Yeah. So they get free health care because they've got this green card. Gotcha. 
And and those are the sort of things that it did, that Manx people do not have it cannot take advantage of. Right. And if, so that's that's the true definition of, yes. of being Manx. I mean, there's many many. There's, there's probably thousands who don't qualify because a Manx father married a, a Scotch Irish Welsh or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, but they're more manx than the ones that are defined. So, so you, know, you, you don't think that that's necessarily right? Then it's just that that is the legal definition. Well, that's what I'm on about. Yes. we have to obey the, the legalities of things. Yeah. So why shouldn't they? All right, some good points there. Thank you for calling, Sylvia. Stu, I was born in the island in 1958. I went to Liverpool to enlist in the army. Uh, on the form, I put my nationality down as British Manx. This was queered. When I told him I was Manx born, I was told, if you want to enlist, you'll be British. In 1960, I was posted to Hong Kong, went by a troop ship without a passport. 1962, I was going to Japan for a holiday and had to obtain a British passport. My nationality entered on that passport, which I still have, is blue marked British passport Hong Kong. My status was British subject citizen of the United Kingdom of Col- and Colonies. I regard my present status as British citizen but Manx resident. That from Norman. Thank you, Norman. Uh, Mike called. I have a copy of the 2006 census and it says under nationality that it's what is recognised under international law and lists the areas which fall under British. Manx isn't recognised its own right any more than English or Scottish or Welsh. They're all British. I phoned the Cabinet Office and asked about the nationality of a friend whose Manx going way back can't work in the EU. They said I'd have to contact the Census Office about that. But I asked if, under international law, Manx person would be represented by the British consulate when abroad. The answer was yes. So, swings and roundabouts, I'm guessing. Manx nationality. Simply, if you're born in the Isle of Man and have a parent born in the island, you are Manx. Simple, says Peter in Balasala. Well, not technically, not according to Sylvia. Both parents, both grandparents, uh, born and educated in the island to qualify legally. I class myself as Manx. We can trace our family history over 400 years on the Isle of Man, but I wasn't born here because of birth complications. Back in the 60s, nobles couldn't cope. I've lived here 47 years now. I'm Manx British. We all have English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh ancestry. It's impossible not to have as they've all ruled or owned us. We should be becoming more British than singular, says Ian. That's an interesting point of view. If you can find that clown from America offensive calling himself a king and object to Elizabeth II claiming to be the Lord of Man, goes a long way to being Manx. It's about being proud in your homeland and its independence, says Josh. I quite like King Dave. I was born on the Isle of Man, lived here all my life. My mother was Manx, my father was English, my grandmother was Manx, my grandfather Irish, so I'm not Manx. Well, what the heck am I? That's from Paul. Very good question, Paul. I've travelled all over the world for years, always put my nationality as Manx. It's never been questioned. I think there could be a problem defining who's Manx. People born here to foreign parents are not Manx. People with a long Manx heritage on both sides who were born elsewhere but who returned and grew up here are Manx. Just being born here doesn't make you Manx. Now then, Biggles, if you're Manx, then you're Manx. But if you're born here but have Scouse parentage, then you're not and have no right to claim to be. Facts, says Frank. I'm not Scouse. I've got no Scouse in my family. Stu, if the Isle of Man is a nation on its own, why can't they have their own census every decade? Big saving for the British government. Happy days for the Manxes. Uh, from a different Dave. It would be interesting to know how many people sending back the census forms cross out British and write Manx. It would certainly give the government an idea about how proud we all are. Just a thought, and it would be just another column on their statistics. That from Julie. Thank you, Julie. Good point. Just living in a country doesn't make you a national. Try asking a Scotsman living in England if he's English, says Tom. Still, I've been living here since 1982. I was born in Scotland, so I'm Scottish, living in the Isle of Man. I'm not Manx. I believe there shouldn't be an issue. If you're born here, then you're Manx. It can't be that difficult. The Manx are a strong and proud nation. In fact, uh, you're quite right. Stu, aged 18 months in 1948, my parents and I came to live here. I went to school here, worked here, and have never and would never live anywhere else. I'm Manx, says Pam. Well, not technically. Stu, what is the percentage of Manx MHKs? Manx meaning both Manx grandparents, asks Rob. That'd be an interesting uh, exercise, wouldn't it, to find out? I'm a long-term resident of the Isle of Man, but I was born in England, therefore I'm English. England is part of Great Britain, so I'm also British. Great Britain is part of the EU. You, so I'm also European. Take your pick, says Tony. Pragmatic way of looking at it, I think, yeah. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. We're talking about steps to maintain the island's reputation on transparency. Earlier this month, the Isle of Man signed an agreement with the UK Treasury Financial Secretary, David Gork, over the exchanges of information of beneficial ownership. The deal means the Manx government must establish a centralised database of companies owned here and disclose information to international authorities on request. But what information is being exchanged and just why has it been necessary for the island to sign up the, to the agreement? 
Parliament to discuss these latest developments and their implications. We're joined in the studio by Chief Minister Alan Bell. Good afternoon, Chief Minister, and thanks very much for coming in today. Good afternoon. Um, let, let's just talk about this because uh, transparency has been one of those sort of political watchwords for as long as I can remember in banks' politics. It seems that we've kind of <laughs> we've built our finance sector on maybe not being transparent over the years, and and the, there are all sorts of benefits, or there have been in the past, uh, about having offshore accounts and things like that. That's all gone now, and it strikes me that that we're at the behest of the international community. That it's not something that we could change if we wanted to, is it? No, uh, I think we need to start by, by realizing you know it's not just the Alabama that, that's uh, not been transparent, perhaps as transparent as it could have been in the past. Every finance centre in one way or another, including the United Kingdom, uh, has had varying degrees of transparency. So, uh, But the, the debate which is going on and which has been going on for some time now has taken it on to a different level. And uh, there is a recognition worldwide that, that financial services all over the place, not uh, onshore as well as offshore, have been abused in, in many ways. And of course, we've had a, a new ingredient recently with the advent of terrorism and terrorism finance, which has added a, a degree of urgency to uh, understanding at last e exactly what goes on in most of these finance centres, who uses them and for what purpose. Now, the, the latest thing that you've been talking about is this beneficial ownership register. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that that's something that isn't available to the public. It's just available to governments. Uh, and is it only available on request or, or do you effectively give the password to the computer system to the UK? No, no, no. It, it's not uh, throwing it open to the United Kingdom at all. They use, uh, initially, uh, we had automatic exchange of information on tax matters. Uh, but that information was only available to the tax authorities and to law, law enforcement authorities. So it's quite specific. Uh, and uh, it's automatic now, uh, but it was on request uh, in the early days. This has moved on now to uh, a central register of beneficial ownership. Generally, this is separate from tax matters. Uh, and again, this information is going to be ava available in due course, not yet, probably not till at least 2019, to the same bodies, tax and law enforcement authorities. OK. Uh, and is it a reciprocal agreement? I mean, I don't suppose we would want to know about the, the beneficial ownership of companies in the UK in the same way that they might want to know about them here. Uh, no, it, but it will be beneficial. This, it, there is a move now for, for general exchange of information worldwide. And we're probably still at the very early stages of how this structure is going to work. Uh, and indeed, talking to the United Kingdom government and indeed further afield, uh, they're still developing their own ideas as to how technically how this is all going to work. And that's why we're looking at least to 2019 before this, this new structure is in, in place. And it may be overtaken by events between now and then anyway. Right. Uh, and for those of us who aren't in the financial services industry and, and don't necessarily understand the importance of this, what, what, what is the big thing about beneficial ownership? Is this that uh, the UK authorities worry that somebody might set up some sort of a, a me mechanism whereby they are hiding assets by, by not being registered themselves, but using maybe a company vehicle or whatever? Yes, it, it's uh, on a number of levels, I think. It's uh, a, a suspicion that, that a number of uh, jurisdictions are being used for the purposes of tax evasion in their own domestic uh, uh, countries. Uh, and the, uh, with the advent of austerity, of course, around large parts of the world, the whole debate about uh, tax fairness, people fair, uh, and businesses paying their own f fair whack in that, those countries is becoming very much uh, uh, to the fore in that debate. So tax evasion is probably uh, f driving the whole debate, but also uh, abuse of uh, tax uh, systems by criminals, money laundering, and as I say, through uh, uh, the advent now of terrorists, uh, that the systems are being abused there. I mean, th th this came a, a lot after you'd started work on this, but the Panama Papers uh, are kind of bearing a lot of this out in that a lot of people yeah. have been very embarrassed to, to have their uh, uh, finances examined. Yeah, it's interesting that, though, but it needs to be kept in perspective. The Panama Papers, there were 11.5 million documents. Yeah. Um, a huge number of documents came out. Um, and uh, the Alaman was mentioned eight times in eight, 11 and a half million. So the Alaman isn't in the crosshairs on, on this one. There were some high profile names mentioned, um, but 
that there has been very little evidence so far of the names mentioned. There's actually that any law has been broken. It's simply facilitating the, the, the movement of, of finance. Now, morally, there's a different argument altogether. Sure. But technically, they have uh, most of them haven't broken uh, any laws. This, though, the Panama Papers, uh, and uh, I say this because most people don't follow finance, but in terms of, of the offshore financial world, which Alaman heavily depends on, a third of our economy is generated by financial services. This is an absolute game changer. And uh, political uh, and uh, civil attitudes around the world uh, are changing quite dramatically. And this is all leading up to uh, May the 12th, when there will be an anti-corruption conference in London, which David Cameron is, is chairing. I've spoken about this before. This is going to be a major event to focus on uh, the abuse of uh, financial centers such as the Isle of Man. And immediately prior to that, on the 9th of May, the second wave of Panama Papers are going to be released. And from what we've been able to pick up, uh, the volume at least of those papers are going to be even bigger than the first one. So uh, over the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a huge amount of focus on uh, finance centers like the Isle of Man and the uh, uh, overseas territories, Channel Islands, and many other countries as well. So we are in for a pretty torrid few weeks. Yeah, I heard you talking in an interview with one of my colleagues this week uh, about this whole thing. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, the worry is that, that we have to remain competitive. And I think you yeah. uh, mentioned in the interview that you, you do worry that, you know, this can all end up getting into a situation where the Isle of Man can no longer be competitive. Uh, and it's all very well people talking about tax transparency and, and you know, uh, income tax rates being uh, the same around the world so that there are no advantages. But, mm-hmm. you know, that's actually anti-competitive. And most governments think that competition is a good idea. Yeah, I, I think uh, the debate which may be starting now about blacklisting jurisdictions, tax havens, as they call them, uh, who have aggressive tax rates is a new departure. Uh, that's only just starting uh, and we will have to see how that uh, plays out. Uh, but it's interesting, one of the countries in in the group of five who have started this initiative is actually Germany, and, and they've been very vocal. But even the German finance minister this week has uh, uh, called for, I think, a, a pause for thought about this, because he's saying that uh, uh, many jurisdictions are now faced with the contradictory position of stimulating tax efficiency and efficient business alongside greater and greater uh, transparency. And sometimes those those two actually work against each other. Uh, So even he is urging a direct degree of caution. So you're absolutely right. You know, everything that goes through the offshore world is not illegal. It's not criminal. It's perfectly legitimate business. And it's what keeps the world economy going. And we mustn't lose sight of that. What we're talking about are on on the margins of people who do abuse the system. But this abuse also takes place onshore. Yeah, you know, we, we look well, at well. That, that's the question. I mean, we, we've heard in the past, and it strikes me as an outsider that there's an amount of hypocrisy about this. In that, you know, the Americans were, were very keen on yeah. tax transparency, and yet they've got the state of Delaware, is it? Which is, yeah. you know, a, a micronation within the, the continental USA. That, that's a, a really interesting point, and it's one I, I've been raising constantly uh, when I'm, I'm off island meeting UK politicians. Uh, the Tax Justice Network, who we've all heard of, Richard Murphy, one of our, our, our long-time admirers, but they're not exactly friends of, of, of uh, the offshores. But they last year drew, drew up a secrecy index. Now, not surprisingly, Switzerland was number one in that. The United States was number three, yeah. the third most secret jurisdiction yeah. in the world. The Isle of Man was 32nd. Yeah. And interesting in that, Panama was 13th and the UK were 15th. So the UK and Panama were almost the same. So the Isle of Man is, is in a different league in comparison to that. But uh, the focus is slowly starting to turn o- on the United States and Delaware in particular. And I, I think I, I've mentioned this statistic before. The Isle of Man has uh, roughly 30,000 companies one way or another registered here. There is one building in Delaware alone which has 285,000 companies, <laughs> yeah. 10 times the amount the Isle of Man has. Yeah. And they don't know the beneficial owner of any of them. And this one house has, this one building, has some of the biggest names registered in the world. Apple, Coca-Cola, a whole raft, Walmart, they're all registered in this one building which is uh, kept in total secrecy. So you're absolutely right when we're talking about hypocrisy, but 
the other thing we're up against, of course, in all this is might is right. And the UK, US has the, the economic and political muscle to be able to turn the screws on some of the smaller jurisdictions. Well, such it's, as always, the it's always struck me that it is the rules of the playground almost international it is. politics, isn't it? Absolutely. In the, the, the big boys decide who does what. Yes, you know, uh, and, and that, that's what we're up against and where we're always, uh, in, a may, in many ways, uh, going to be pushed onto the back foot because the, the UK, the European Union, the US, wherever it might be, uh, always focal, focus their attention on the small jurisdictions uh, who are always going to be struggling to defend themselves against that, that weight of opposition. And people get in touch with this programme quite often and say, why aren't our government fighting harder for this? Or why aren't our <laughs> government doing more in terms of dealing with the UK about this? Uh, and I guess if we're talking <clears throat> playground politics, then, you know, th there is a limit to what we can do. But, yeah. but where do we go with <laughs> things like that? I mean, what sort of bargaining chips have you got? Uh, have you ever intimated to any of your counterparts in the UK, well, you know, carry on, guys, because if you carry on like this, we'll just go fully independent Dependent, and then you'll have no control over us at all. Well, that's an easy argument. Uh, I mean, first of all, I understand what people say, that, that we should be doing more. I can assure you there's probably very little more that we can do. I spend a great deal of my time in London, in Westminster, dealing with politicians, with ministers, with opinion makers, with business leaders, and that the constant message goes out about the Isle of Man's uh, leading position. And, and that's no uh, exaggeration. We have taken the lead of many of the small jurisdictions, Indeed, we're ahead of most of the, the on, onshore jurisdictions. But there is a limit to, to what we can do. We have to keep pushing ourselves forward. And also, uh, the uh, way the Alabama has been able to read the political direction of, of the international debate on regulation, on transparency, has by and large kept the Alabama out of the crosshairs of, of some of the attacks which are, are, are coming. Um, but if the Alabama was to say, right, we've had enough, we're going independent, in many ways, that'll leave us in an even weaker position right. because at least now, as we are a dependency of the United Kingdom, nominally at least the UK have to look after our interests. If we were completely independent, there would be no restraint on them anymore. They, they can just treat us as, a, as another small country with no responsibility whatsoever and they, they could turn the guns on us. I don't think that would happen, but um, don't think that the Alaman being independent is in any way going to get us away from, from this. It will probably, certainly in the short to medium term, leave us in an even weaker position. Yeah, well, that's always been the argument, hasn't it? And I, I think that, you know, historically, you, you, you've you got nationalist leanings. I think that Absolutely, in yes. many ways you'd like the Isle of Man to be independent. But the, the message I've always got talking to politicians about this is we're better in than out. It's like the EU yes. debate. You know, we're better yeah. with uh, the UK than, uh, than outside. But the, the, there might be a sort of a cross crossover point where that becomes less the case. Do you, do you, can you see that on the horizon? I can't actually, no, because, you know, if we're honest, if you look around the world today and, and the, the point you make about the UK and, and the EU referendum is a really good example, no country is truly independent anymore. You know, the UK referendum is as much about trying to the UK to become more independent than it is at the moment. The UK is not independent. So, uh, and you can see the struggles they're having to, to reassert themselves. Put in context, the Alaban trying to do the same thing, we really will not make any difference at all. It, we will just be swept away, frankly. I am a, a passionate believer in the Alaban. As you rightly say, I came into politics uh, strongly supporting the idea of, of greater independence for the Alaban. But the world has changed over the last 40 odd years, and we've got to recognise that. And uh, we need all the friends and allies we can get. Going independent is actually not going to make any difference at all. All right. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. You're listening to the latest Talking Heads podcast, featuring highlights from the programme over the past week. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Should areas where there are nesting birds be closed off to the public completely at this time of the year? The police have issued a warning about nesting birds around the airs in the north of the island. The area is popular for the likes of oyster catchers, ringed plover and arctic and little terns, the latter two being protected species. So, should areas where there are nesting birds be out of bounds to everyone this time of the year? Or would that penalise people who are responsible when it comes to the natural world? Should dogs be banned altogether from these areas? Or is taking your pet for a walk in the area acceptable as long as it's kept on a lead? Our first caller on this is Neil. Hello, Neil. I enjoy the countryside, walking in the countryside and cycling, etc. And I think that um, 
if people want access to the countryside, which I think we all do, nobody wants to go back to Victorian times where um, where access was restricted just for the for the landowner. Yeah. But um, if we want access, then I think we have to accept the rules which go along with the countryside care sort of program. Okay. And I think um, we shouldn't certainly shouldn't be disturbing um, nesting birds. It isn't it isn't just the airs where people walk through the birds. There's um, there's a very good nesting site at Lang Ness along Sandwick Beach. A lot you get a lot of um, moorland birds down there etc nesting and people just plow through there with their dogs and disturbing them through the spring and um i think it's um, quite rude actually and arrogant of us to have so such a complacent attitude to to the rest of um you know the species which are on this planet okay um, i also think it should be extended actually because um you know the farmers have a huge amount of damage done with sheep worrying etc mm. and uh, the hill lambing season is upon us now and i think dogs especially should be banned from the hills during the lambing season i think it should be extended to cover that as well all right or just allowed on leads maybe no i don't think even they should even be allowed on leads i mean i was brought up around sheep my grandmother had about two three hundred ewes at one time and um, all, all sort of breeding yeah. and um if a strange person goes into the field, it actually worries the sheep. They get used to the same people visiting them. Oh, I so when see. You have, we have, when, when, you, when you put strange people in the area of sheep, the sheep worry. And it isn't the fact that um, they just get attacked by dogs. It's the fact that they get stressed. And that yes. stress causes early abortions and things like that, or twisted lambs in the womb. And it's an absolute nightmare trying to sort it all out. Oh, gotcha. My uncle actually had experience of this. But certainly the, um, the birds have to be, uh, have to be protected. Yeah. I think people, people fail to realise how fortunate we are in having these, um, these terns, etc., visiting the island and, and setting up their site on the air. And I think um, we, we really need to appreciate them and sort of uh, nurture them, not sort of um, neglect them and certainly uh, not batter them into submission by uh, disturbing their nesting site on a regular basis. All right. Yeah, well, I take your point. Like I say, I don't know anything about wildlife, so it's not something that particularly affects me. But, uh, I mean, what about people who say, well, hang on a minute, you know, don't people come first? There are lots of people who enjoy taking the dog for a walk on Lang Ness or whatever. So, you know, why why should they be put off so that we can have birds landing there instead? Yeah, but yeah, but the whole... The whole, um, the whole um, facility of walking in the countryside is to actually enjoy what's there right i see and if if the birds aren't there you've nothing really to look (laughs) at you know (laughs) from my angle i mean i I actually have um, a friend who 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 had a stroke a few years ago and um, i collect him each year and we go down to the um to the organ recital which is a broad which is a great afternoon out he's he's quite musical much much more so than me and um i always prepare a sort of slight picnic and bit a few cakes and bits and pieces like that and we sit on the airs and last year we were actually down there in the turn nesting season and i was horrified to see this bloke and um, walk right through the the area which had been penned off and fenced off and marked up quite quite you know quite courteously by the by the by the yeah. warden down there and him and his wife just walked right through the middle of the site with their two dogs and a huge mess and i thought how absolutely ignorant and rude you've, you've no um well no it's it, but some people. people are like that aren't they you know if you mark out an area and say you know if you put a line in the, in the sun and say don't cross this line it, it, that's a challenge to a lot of people and it's i've never understood that yeah you know, I know. you're it's not telling challenge. me where i can yeah. walk and where i can't well, i pay me taxes you know it's that sort of I attitude know. isn't it i know i know i mean really you can understand why uh, victorian landowners had these had these laws around um denying access to the countryside to protect their their grouse and their nesting birds and their pheasants, etc., and, and, and other species, obviously. But um, nobody wants to turn the clock back to those sort of days. And access needs to be allowed, but also needs to be respected, I think. All right, some good points. Thank you very much for joining us today, Neil. Most people walking their dogs also enjoy wildlife spotting, wouldn't want to damage it. It's only a short time. There are lots of walking areas. I think people need clear and properly visible notices with explanation. Uh, there will always be those who don't care or have thought for others, including our precious wildlife, says Claire. Thank you, Claire. Michael says, I was once down at Niarbal and were near the rocky paths when suddenly Arctic terns began to bombard me. It got worse as I walked further. It was scary. Sounds like a scene from a Hitchcock film. Uh, I noticed on the ground they had baby birds wandering around, so I turned back. They were only defending their young. I completely agree with you, caller. This is from Wendy regarding irresponsible dog owners, but the police should also be warning and preferably catching the trail bikers 
trail bikers who ride illegally on such sites. Also, a seemingly increasing number of mountain bikers who think they can ride on footpaths in areas where there are nesting birds. OK, well, absolutely. One rule for uh, everybody in that case, I would have thought. Yes, thank you. Stu, the officer interviewed didn't mention the penalties involved under the relevant legislation, the Wildlife Act 1990. It's a fine of up to £5,000 for each bird, nest or dependent chick disturbed. Wow! A court can also order the forfeiture of anything used to cause the disturbance, such as a vehicle or an animal, which in relation to dog walkers could clearly include the family pet. Those not considering abiding by the restrictions may want to consider that, says Dave. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. £5,000 for each bird nest or... Well, (laughs) you nest of half a dozen of them, you're 30 grand in the red. Immediately, if you sort of stumble upon them. But as with most of these things, what we need are a couple of people to be prosecuted under that and given big fines to get the message out to other people that you know it really isn't acceptable arctic term turns are vicious when they're defending their young and they'll dive bomb anyone who gets too close if they manage to strike your head they can draw blood far better to keep well away says jenny <laughs> i'll stay watching the telly i think i'll stay that far away from it stew motorhomes have to be careful not to harm birding environments the restriction from certain parts of the island means that areas are safer from all the discarded junk and obvious hazards of a three ton of that from a fairly thanks for getting in touch i've lived near and walked across the airs for years and i've never seen a trail bike being used there since it was banned turns being disturbed down there is one thing you can't blame off-road bikers for that doesn't seem to put your contributors off some people just don't have enough to do says dave i'm not getting involved in that one i don't know the nation station manx radio What do you make of this year's local authority general election? Six districts went to the polls yesterday and voter turnout varied between areas. At the close of nominations at the start of the month, many boards found themselves with fewer members than they had seats to fill and many other candidates were elected unopposed. To reflect on that situation and to discuss just what the role of local authorities is in the Isle of Man, we join in the studio now by retiring Ramsey Commissioner Richard Radcliffe and retiring Michael Commissioner Steve Hamer. I I mean, how do you guys feel about that? Because I I think there's been a concern this year uh, that fewer people seem to be prepared to stick their head over the parapet and, and become commissioners. You know, are people getting a bit disenchanted by the whole thing about local authorities? I think part of the problem was that sitting members who had no intention of standing didn't announce that until very close to polling day, which gave potential new candidates very limited time to prepare themselves for election. And of course, we have the House of Keys general election coming up in September and there are certainly some members who are keeping their powder dry for that rather Uh, than going for the local elections. Well I think one of the suggestions that we heard on the programme earlier this year was that maybe the local authority elections ought to take place the year after the Keys elections to to prevent that from happening. I don't know if you've got a point of view on that. Yeah I agree entirely with that because there are some very skilled people who are going to go for the House of Keys not be elected and are then Yes. Left with no opportunity to take part in politics for the next four years. Yeah. And a lot of people see local authorities as a stepping stone to national politics, but it also works the other way around, doesn't it, in Peel? Uh, I see that a former MHK is now a commissioner. So, uh, you know, it's a two-way street. It certainly is, yeah. In terms of MHKs, it's a great apprenticeship for them because they become used to the frustrations of working (laughs) with... Working with government and, yeah. the, and the machine in there that seems to be uh, designed for its own protection. There seems yeah. to be an amount of cynicism there. Is that why you're, you're retiring from it? Oh, I'm a died in the wool cynic. Yeah, I've been training for years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, what, what, what was being said there, I would uh, I agree with in that I believe MHK should have done a stint in local authorities yeah. beforehand because too often there are, uh, there are debates in, in Tinwell where clearly had they done something in local, poli- uh, you know, local authorities first, they wouldn't be saying what they're saying. Now, as far as uh, you uh, put pointed out, Stu, there are, uh, I think there were six, uh, only six places, uh, commissioners or wards, where there were votes. That's very healthy, actually, because unless you uh, have uh, a vote, you don't know, there's no manifestos being produced, there's no hustings to uh, to know what people think. Um, so, and then if there is a vote, you've got an indication of, of which are the popular 
people for the community and maybe to help elect chairman. So you actually need the sort of energies of younger people and tempered by the experience of older ones and a mix of women and, and men. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, let me ask you about this young fellow that's been elected in Laxia then, uh, Liam Miller, I think he's called, 85% right. of the vote. Chief Minister we heard in the news was congratulating him, saying it's a great day for democracy and it's great that we're getting young people involved in politics. At 18, I don't know if I knew how to tie my shoelaces, to be honest. Is it not too young? You know, is the, the whole idea of politics people with experience, life experience, are able to help other people? No, have a mixture of youth, which is full of enthusiasm and experience, which will guide that enthusiasm in the right direction. It's fabulous that somebody who's 18 cares enough about his community to, to put his yeah. head up. Up above the trenches, it's great. Yeah, but I mean, can he do much at 18, Stephen? You know, I think you need mentors in the system, and this is where the where the, you've got commissioners who've been in post a few years. I've been in 12 years, and, and there are others longer than that. And every day you're learning something new, uh, but eventually you've learned not to reinvent the wheel, yeah. and you know which areas of government you can perhaps help or inf get help or influence and you know others that are going to take years to get what you're trying to do yeah. so they come in you can come in with great enthusiasm uh, uh, but but don't get disappointed if you haven't changed the world within six months. Yes, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose that you know, uh, pet owners will understand this. If you if your dog or your cat's getting on its last legs, the best thing to do is to buy a puppy or a kitten because that sort of wakes them up a bit, doesn't it, and gives them a uh, a purpose again. So maybe that'll work like this. Mm, yeah, mm. Uh, Richard. I mean, what do you think about this idea of, of five local authorities rather than what we've got at the moment? Do you think that that would be a benefit, or or would it actually work against people? It would uh, save on audit costs and things like that, but there are also a, a huge amount of joint boards as well that perhaps we don't need. But it, if you had one board dealing with the, the major items such as housing and yeah. then subcommittees that keep their local input, that would be the best model. Well, I think you're doing something like that in the north, aren't you, in Ramsey? We're trying to put those together, yes, we can t do things like the civic community site housing that we've mentioned. Yes. Re refuse is something that we could certainly all contribute to uh, reducing costs on. What are the biggest challenges uh, that the new commissioners are going to face, say, in Ramsey? Uh, finding out where they are and dealing with government departments. They will come in with great enthusiasm and then find that they come up against uh, roadblocks in government departments. Uh, but why is that? You say that, but why is that? Is that because you've got you've got ministers and you've got, you know, MHKs protecting the fiefdoms or, you know, what, what, why is the this constant sort of battle? You hit the nail on the head. There are ministers who are certainly protecting their fiefdoms, but you also have civil servants who see that if services are farmed out to local authorities that they're jobs will be at risk so obviously they're they're doing their level best to protect their jobs that's why we come up with this nonsense of means testing every service you have the perfect way of means testing and it's called income tax yeah and if people don't earn enough then pay them back through the tax system yeah it's one calculation you, you don't need an army in every department working it out so i mean is central government saying one thing but meaning another then because you know they're constantly talking about uh actually devolving more of what they do to local authorities is that them just trying to save money from their budgets and and drop it on your toes instead they are trying to pass costs to the local authorities but still keep control off it themselves ah and therein lies the rub. So you'd be prepared to take it on, but if you were given control of it, is that the the headline news? Absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fair yeah. dues. I mean, some of that they they would say is well, we need a common standard. Yeah. Uh, it's not quite true. I mean, we we've sat down uh, with uh, local authorities from around Pale, Patrick, all through there, and said, let's look at things like uh, refuse collection. Uh, is it? If we were to combine, is it cheaper? Yeah. Well, the short answer is, if you get a, a, an urban authority, it's a darn sight cheaper to draw a wagon down a street picking up one bin after the other of course it is. than in the rural areas where you're going up farm lanes and other things. Um, so the, the short answer is, 
at the moment with the small authorities they should if they've done the sums right got each each one's got the best deal yeah. for that area uh, the issue uh, i think that richard mentioned is that where you've got central control um there's a point at which i'm happy that uh, experienced civil servants are there for advice but it's when they try to control things and there were talk of uh, not all that long ago, trying to bring an all-island refuse arrangement yes. where they start work in the morning at the incinerator and then drive out to Ramsey and all of this. Um, and, and they really weren't thinking it through. Um, and, uh, and again, they was talking of a weekly collection. That might be needed in some areas, but we, we, don't, we don't want need any. If you, want it, if you need more than one bin, you can buy a second bin yeah. and have it emptied in a fortnight. <laughs> There's an awful lot that seems to sort of make people stumble and trip up and take forever to resolve that are actually just common sense answers, aren't they? And that's a prime example of that, really. Mm. Yeah, so uh, what about uh, the other call that we hear quite often is that we ought to have a single uh, all-island rate. So are you saying that because each area is different, it's got different demands, and different ways of doing things, that that would never work, or do you think that that would be fair? No, I don't think it will. And I mean, uh, I'm looking as a rural authority, we have virtually no business income for business rates. If you look at Douglas which is often, you've heard, bleating, and it went through Tinwald not long, two years ago, is to say, well, you know, the rest of the island ought to f help fund Douglas. Yeah. Uh, but what about all the, the rates income from the shops and, and other businesses in Douglas? Why are Douglas rates what they are? That's the real question, yes. not, not the other way around. Why, what, why are the rules not paying the way because the rates are lower? Yeah. <laughs> have we got some comments from our listeners? I think we have. Predictably, I'm absolutely thrilled as far as the Castletown election is concerned. This is from Nick. It's excellent to see more than half the commissioners are new faces, all with good ideas. There are one or two faces that are no longer featured, which is most certainly a huge relief. It's exactly what Castletown needs. Hopefully we have a bright future. Um, it, it begs the question, you know, with, with um, you know, pretty much all new board, uh, is it going to take a, a period of years for that to be a, a proper working board? It will take them certainly 12 months before they are familiar with the way everything operates, but that doesn't mean it should curb their enthusiasm for changing things. Obviously, budgets, etc., have been set for the next 12 months. Now is the time to start sorting out your priorities for next year if you're a new member. Right. OK. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. That's it for the latest look back at Talking Heads. Our thanks as ever to everyone who took part in the programme. If you'd like to get involved in the discussion yourself, you can call, text or email between midday and 2pm on weekdays. Or you can share your thoughts on the Facebook page. You can do that anytime, and that's Talking Heads with Stu Peters. You can listen back to each day's programme in full using the on-demand section of Manx Radio's website. And the website's also where you'll find a daily update of what we're discussing on the programme. You can also keep up to date with that information by liking the Facebook page or following Stu Manx on Twitter. And if there's anything you'd like us to discuss on the programme, why not suggest it to us by emailing talk at manxradio.com. And again, you can do that at any time. But that's it for now. So until next time, goodbye. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all-new Superfast Plus Broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click shaw.com. Love being sure. Terms and conditions apply.